You are now in the realm of enlightenment and transformation, as brought to you by the Foundational Friday. Our core aim is to present an experience, an opportunity for your soul to reascend to its place of origin by cultivating a healthier spiritual awareness and emotional maturity. This show serves as a free offering to the greater community and an addendum requirement for all a new spiritual training students. For all those listening, if you'd like to move closer to the calculations and fundamental understandings of the new order, be sure to pick up the book, Grasping the Root of Divine Power. If you desire a spiritual reading to help you map your current spiritual position in the face of your world and learn the greatest pathways for your fortune, in this season, you can go to the SaduluHouse.com. That is S-A-D-U-L-U-H-O-U-S-E dot com. You can also go to OrishaReligion.com to find out how you can become a student and member of the New Spiritual Order. That's O-R-I-S-H-A. R E L I G I O N dot com. High priest in an ancient West African tradition, teacher, community leader, revolutionary, artist, writer, and lecturer, and so much more. Yuya has been working with the spirit world through various indigenous native systems for over 20 years as a spiritual counselor and guide. He is also the temple head of A New Nation, where he has initiated a cadre of students into the A New Spiritual Order and currently teaches indigenous occult and mystery systems, African philosophy and spiritual sciences and divination. He has taken on the divine call to serve as a jagna. A jagna is one who guides, counsels, and protects their community. Yuya is an invested community pillar, always standing at the ready, serving as an agent of transformation for all those in need of change. He is the author of Grasping the Root of Divine Power, as well as Solutions for Dysfunctional Family Relationships. To better know Yuya, feel free to travel to a new nation. Dot org. Greetings, family. Here we are again, another Foundational Friday, and I am your conductor and host, Yuya Asan Anu, Chief Jegna of the Anu Spiritual Order and Head Instructor of the Sedula House Spiritual Center, where we do specialize in self-actualizing, self-revealing, and self-defining spirituality. Okay, I added some things onto the tagline there, but you understand where I'm going with this. We're dealing with the journey of the self and the importance of doing your own work and putting yourself at the center of your journey so that your purpose can be revealed and brought forth. In any event, uh, I have a really interesting and exciting segment for you this Friday. Uh, I will be sharing with you a segment that I did recently with the esteemed Dr. Alim Bay. Okay. And he's one I've been admiring for many years, not just because of the content that Alim uh, delivers, Dr. Bay, but more so because of the humility of spirit and energy that he delivers it with. I've always enjoyed uh, just his energy and his zeal and excitement for information and data and how that conveys and comes across uh, to those who he teaches. So it's always an honor to be able to share space on his segment and even to build with his students uh, and those who follow his show. So I want you to check out this show. You're going to enjoy it. Get your notepads, get comfortable. And we're dealing with the science of the Okan, the Okan, which is the science and the, the metaphysical understanding and esoteric understanding of the seat of intelligence as understood by Ifa and, and Orisha tradition. Okay, so I know you will all really enjoy this segment and you will get a lot out of it. And uh, I am excited and pleased to bring it to you. Okay, listen up, stay tuned, and here we go.
All right, so what you got for tonight about organic um, the medicines of the heart? Where you want to deal with that topic and where you want to go at with Okay, cool. Well, you know, first off, I want to definitely thank you for uh, having me on again. And, um, you know, the last time, thank you, yeah, I was here, we were able to kind of cover some, some Arisha information. And I was basically looking to, you know, bring up a basic understanding for those who may not have been aware uh, of the more scientific aspects of the Arisha. But uh, even in, in this tradition or in this, this European understanding, there is so much more going on in the uh, what we'll call the spiritual ecosystem aside from Orisha. And there's one key piece to something that I touched on last time. And I spoke about this energy or this force known as the Ori, which is spelled O-R-I. And I explained that the Ori is is not only the aura not only the understanding of your own soul and spirit, but your doppelganger, your over spirit, your higher self. Okay. And what I wanted to speak about this evening was uh, this understanding of the Okan. And Okan is spelled O K A N, Okan. And in our Yoruba understanding, or just, we'll just deal with the language for a moment. Uh, the word Okan means heart. Okay, so it is heart. So we're speaking about your flesh heart, your physical and biological heart, but we're also speaking about the conceptual understanding of the heart. And in the Yoruba understanding, uh, well, I, I should say the Yoruba uh, temple understanding when we're dealing with, with Ifa and when we're dealing with the Risha, the heart is not just a, an emotional centerpiece, but the heart itself is a realm. And within that realm of the heart, it has its own dimensional architecture. Okay, so just like we have uh, IA, which is spelled A Y E I A, and IA is the residence or the place of the person. Okay, in the Yoruba tradition, we separate the soul from the person. The person we call Inyan, and any and the Inyan lives in IA. Because we understand that the person is created through the expression of spirit and through the intention and destiny that's been laid out by the soul. Okay, but we have something that stands over the the, uh, the person who's seeking to master the mind of the person and is witnessing the mastering of the mind of the person. And in that realm where your Ori resides, is that the name of that realm is the Okan. Again, O-K-A-N um, For anyone who may be familiar with Yoruba You probably know also that um, Okan, it also means the number one Okay, uh, interesting thing about, about Yoruba uh, For anyone who's ever tried to study it You know it's, it's, it's a complicated language because it's all tonal You know, it's very hard to just pick up a book Per se on Yoruba and, and then get it you got to you got to hear those tones and sometimes it's so subtle. It's like one word, one spelling can mean 10 different things. Uh, but but the reason that is, is because the Yoruba language is is deeply entrenched in metaphysics. OK, so uh, one thing just doesn't mean one thing. But what one word does is it opens up a gateway or a portal to a certain type of understanding. And depending on how you inflect the tone of that word will decide which dimension you go within that realm that you just opened up with that word. OK, so we have the Okan. When we say Okan, Okan, we know that we're opening up that heart realm, OK, which is considered to be the seat of our intelligence. It's not just the seat of our soul, but it's the seat of our intelligence. But Understanding that it also means one, uh, and I wanted I want to just qualify that that term one uh, doesn't signify quantity, but when we say one in this instance, it signifies the order of manifestation. So it's more of a sequential thing. So when we say one, con, k a n, it should also be noted that con is also one in Medu. Uh, for those of you who do know who are, who are listening. The Yoruba culture comes out of the Kemetic culture. It was considered um, out of the southern region. 
So the the cool thing about that is that you know you can um, though many people will tell you you know and many many people have spoken against me in terms of uh, mixing traditions as they they like to say, but the truth is it really is all one. You know it's it's is one truth. Yeah, you you know, brother, because I you know I listen to, to to your work and I've been following your work for years, and obviously you understand that science of assimilation, of taking, you know, different information and, and understanding the truth in it. The only thing that differs, the only time we find a difference in information is when it's a lie. So everyone should understand that the, the truth is always going to be the same thing, and the part that's that's different, that separates it, that contradicts, is going to be the false part. And that's in any tradition. I don't care what you study. You know, when you put them all together and put them in a bag, the truth will stand as that which is the same. You know, um, so, yeah, that that idea of Khan, K-A-N, which we have in Medu, uh, but also, you know, etymologically in Yoruba, Khan, K-A-N, also means one as well. So it's that one, that primal, that primordial one that Khan represents. Okay, so um, Okan, whenever you have the O, and I kind of mentioned this last time, uh, when you have that O, you're dealing with ownership. Anytime you see O in the Yoruba language, it means either the owner of or the spirit of. It means that every time. Okay, so it's an easy way for you to start kind of breaking down words and figuring out you know what what they're actually saying here you know for instance we just had a uh, what they call a blood moon last night and uh and in this tradition the or this language the moon the name of the moon is osu osu o s u osu and some may notice that that's very similar to the spelling of oshun which is o s u n okay and then we also have odus by the name of irosun and Oshun or Osu, it means the source. Okay? And when you have Irosun, it means the source in which blood comes. So Irosun deals with the, that menses, the idea of the menses, and it relates itself again to the uh, moon. And Osu also relates itself to the word Kansu, who we know in our comedic st- structure was the night traveler of the moon. Which was a was a uh, implication towards the menstrual cycle, going through that night of melanin. All right, um, and this is directly connected to our understanding of Okan, and I'm gonna I'm get into that. Um, and by the way, brother, if I, you know, you if if I if you want me to just keep going, I can keep going. But if you want me to pause in between, because I know I know you you uh, have your own perspective, so you may want to interject. Just let me know. Oh, no. Keep going, brother. Continue on. Oh, okay. um, brother, um, Raheem, did you have something to say? Uh, I just, uh, I, I just touched you know, on the thing about uh, uh, what they call the uh, the homo homo uh, cysteine uh, around the heart. I know you know about that. The homo cysteine. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah, it was it, it, it called. It, they call it the uh, what it's called is the inflammation of the heart arteries, and uh, most people don't know if their heart arteries are ever inflamed because they have stopped uh, uh, checking have physicals on those uh, medical tests on those in the early 1920s, and this would be kind of detriment to the uh, medical profession if they found out that that would solve a lot of, a lot of heart disease on a large scale. And uh, so they have stopped with the physical, you know, uh, checking on to see if your the homocysteine is okay. Yeah, that's, that's what's going on also. Okay. And, and from um, the, what the conspiracy you talk about, yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that for all my, my Orisha people. As you know, the heart obviously pumps blood through the body. And when we're dealing with the heart chakra, we're dealing with the Orisha Ogun. A lot of times people that think that the heart is mainly dealing with Oshun because as soon as you think about the heart, you're thinking about love. But you have to understand that uh, in the Yoruba structure, love and life are synonymous with, with each other. We have a word for love. It's Ife. We have a, lear- a word for life. It's Ife. 
And it is said that life began in Ile Ife. Ile means house, which that means the house of love and the house of life. Okay, so it's that vitality of life that is considered love. So what the elder was just speaking about in terms of these possible conditions with the heart, you know, if, if you wanted to apply uh, any Orisha formula to that, the, the advice would be to begin with Ogun. To begin with Ogun when you're dealing with, with inflammations and problems with artery, the, the, the roads. Because remember, not only he's he's the owner of the road, but he's the owner of the road, the roads of bloodways. Okay. And interesting enough, uh, the word or the name Ogun means herbs, the owner of the spirit of herbs. Okay. So, you know, I know we always think Ogun is just militancy and taking machetes and cutting through the woods and killing up people, but um, his first responsibility is a master herbalist. Okay, so, you know, relating it again to heart conditions, you know, as the elder was, was speaking on, I think uh, you want to look there first. Uh, one of the things that I'm always looking to do and looking to share with people is the sobriety of the Ifa tradition. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times when you start speaking about Orisha, you start speaking about Ifa, it gets so cartoonish that you can't really get anywhere. People start telling you, you know, don't put this one on this shrine. This one fights with that. And it, it, it's just silly. And there's a deep metaphysical value held. And it's not only in the Yoruba language, but held in these formulas that we call Orishas. Because what they actually are, are cosmic formulas. More than anything. You know, more than your friend or the one who rules your head or whatever you've been told. They're actually formulas who live within their own matrix of understanding they have their own heavens and they have their own hells but when you move beyond the matrix and and the traps of polarities that the orisha have for you you move into the realm of the okan and in the okan is where there is no formation of duality there is no positive negative right wrong that that whole understanding doesn't even exist that doesn't exist until we come into what we call aye or the, the astral planes, and that's where we have the formation of colors, the formations of images come into play, and how things uh, look. When we're dealing with the Okan realm, we're dealing with straight consciousness and light. We're dealing with consciousness and light, okay? So obviously, if we're dealing with light, there's an alternative realm, which is gonna, it's gonna bring us to darkness, which we'll, we'll get into in a moment. But, um, the there's there's an there's an odu that's associated with okan or this idea of the heart or this idea of the seed of the soul and that particular odu is okoran meji okoran meji and okoran is o k a n r a n okay meji is spelled m e j i and meji or edgy in yoruba just means twin or twins okoran itself means to know okay it brings us into that that concept and that string of co cognition that um lets us know things but it's more so the um the validation of knowledge using subjective certainty okay so the the, the certainty remains subjective because it's subject to um to review after the reformation of a person's worldview Okay, so, or, or the reformation of a person's world expansion. So what this basically means when you're tapping into the realm or the energy of Okoran, meaning to know, uh, you're tapping into knowledge that is only uh, validated by your certainty of your current worldview, which expands once you take in new knowledge. So in essence, we're dealing with uh, the mutation and the expansion of truth. Okay, it, it's it's truth is always a subjective certainty. All right. Um, now, something that's also in that the name of that Odu Okoran. You you notice you have Okan, but then at the, on the back end you have the word Ron. Ron is a very uh, important word in the Yoruba, Yoruba tradition because Ron means to call. Okay, uh, or it also means to send out or to recite or to remember. Okay, so when you say the Odu Okoran. You're saying, I'm calling out the heart. I'm sending the heart. I'm reciting the heart. I'm remembering the heart. 
Because why is it so important to remember, recite, and to recall the heart? Because the heart is where your where your your real self or your ori, the I, resides. Okay, um, the I is considered a force. Okay, and it is the potentiality of the seer. Remember, because the I, the seer that resides in in, in the okan, is watching you, the person, master your mind. Okay, it's witnessing the mastering. Of your mind, okay. Uh, the Okan is the domicile of the higher of your higher consciousness. So now we'll take it right back to English. So I'm saying, the heart, the conceptual, the metaphysical, the esoteric heart, is the actual domicile, the place where where, where your your higher consciousness resides. Okay, because we always when we start speaking about higher consciousness, a lot of times we we're looking all over the place. We're looking over our head. Inside of our head and our, our first eye, so forth and so on. And all of those things from your belly button to the back of your neck to your first eye, they all serve a purpose in your ascension. But I'm just speaking about the, the Yoruba concept, you know, and, and other concepts may look at a little bit different. But um, in a Yoruba concept, it is the heart that holds the domicile. Uh, and like I said, it's considered a realm of its own with its own dimensional uh, arch architecture. So going back to the Odu of Okoran, right? Uh, just to give a little bit of information, especially for those of you who are listening, who actually uh, deal with Odu or trying to learn Odu. Um, there's, there's a critical thing when you read in Patakis, dealing with this this Odu, Okoran. And one of the first things you'll find is that in most of the Patakis, and Patakis are the stories, uh, the fables, um, the information that associated with each Odu. And the Odu, as I said in the first show, means womb. The word Odu means womb. So just like in the name Olodumare, the, the name Olodumare means the owner of the serpent's womb. Mare means serpent. And remember, O, I told you whenever you have that O, that means ownership. So, or the spirit of. Olodumare is the owner of the serpent's womb. Okay, that is the uh, one of the supreme beings <laughs> in, in the Yoruba tradition. Okay, but that's the supreme being that we're able to conceptualize because that's the one who actually came out into the light. So, that would uh, be equivalent to what we refer to as the universal energy or prana kutaling in the Sanskrit. Yes. The interesting thing about um, Olodumare is that it's it's the Olodumare is the product of the universal energy. You see, um, the universal energy, you know, we have to kind of go back to that triple stage darkness. Or again, if we're dealing with the, with the Kabbalistic system, when we, we're dealing with Sof and Sof Ur, that which which exists before Kether. And you kind of almost want to associate Olodumare with Kether, the crown, because being the, the owner of the serpent's womb, taking us even to our comedic Atumare, what we're speaking about is the atomic beginnings of something. When something decides to form itself into something, when something decides to define itself. Okay, so Olodumare, we can conceptualize to some small degree because this is when the universal energy decided to, to define, to make a definition for itself. But again, we have to acknowledge what was the energy that even decided to do that, <laughs> you know. So that that goes closer um, a bit to, to to what you're speaking, you know. Um, there there are, and that's that's the thing, brother Ali. You know, in this tradition, uh, so many people they think it's like only Orisha, or they think it's just Orisha ancestors and Oludumare. And there's so many other forces at work, and more importantly, um, and a lot of people may not even want to hear this. You actually don't need any of those forces. The only force you actually need is your ori, which is your higher self. That's even in certain fables. That's in certain phrases, you know, um, certain patakis. You don't need ancestors. You don't need orisha. Um, you, some, and some people don't even work with orisha or ancestors or odu. They just work with themselves. Okay. These are all tools that were, that were given to us. You know, and that's where it gets a little confusing sometimes for our people because they bring this religious mindset into it and they have to find something to worship something to humble themselves to 
uh, and something outside of themselves that they have to acknowledge as redeeming them or reclaiming them. And unfortunately, because of that, many people get stuck in their in their understanding of the Yoruba tradition. It's, it's hard for them to move forward, and and it's very hard for them to conceptualize what actual Yoruba culture is saying. One of the things that helps that again is learning the language or some of the language. I know it's hard, but you know, learning some of the language. Um, you know, a, a, a good example of that, brother Aline, is um, the term "I." Or the word I um, that we have, you know, I mean, you know, like the individual in Yoruba structure, the word I is mo, M-O is mo. That means I. And you have M-E, which means the self. But more importantly, if you take mo and you flip it around, you have om. And om, as you know, is considered the highest part of one's being. You know, so um, it, it's 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 kind of like uh, it's very difficult because some people will immediately think, oh, this must this sounds like some form of self idolatry. I'm worshiping myself, but in truth, you're empowering yourself and you're mastering self for the purposes of actually honoring the Most High. You know, um, and that particular Odu or that idea of Okoran speaks to that heavy. For instance, uh, with Okoran. Uh, or Okanran Again remember we're dealing with the calling of the heart uh, The physical element That's that's associated With that Odu is carbon Okay and In our Yoruba mythology Carbon is talked about left and right All over but we never really <laughs> it, It's hard for us to pinpoint because they don't Use the word carbon um, And as I'm sure you've Spoken to your, your listeners And I know you have a very educated audience You know that carbon is it, is a form of melanin And the way that carbon is always recited And called in the Yoruba Patakis Is they use the term forest Whenever you hear them speaking about the forest They're actually speaking about carbon Okay So again there's so much You know for instance even um, The sign The, the Odu of Okoran It associates itself with the planet Mercury Which we also know Is one of the words for carbon you see, so um, when you're going into that heart realm, yeah, when you're going into the heart, what you're doing actually is you're going into the darkness of your own melanin. And that's where knowing is found. That's why Okoran means to know. In order to know, you have to go into that corruptive and transforming darkness to know. You know, so um, it's it's a critical piece in terms of that, in terms of understanding the um Association with the heart And uh, especially understanding The Yoruba concept of the heart It's not this um, amorous uh, Concept of love That we have And You know I felt it was It was it is critical, was critical To address because um, Some of the questions that I've been coming across My desk lately in terms of How we should regard each other And how we should regard love And so forth And uh, It's a term that so many uh, do not understand And they associate it with Yoruba stories About the heart, about the Okan And they're mixing in uh, Romance, they're mixing in Roman ideas With these Yoruban And these comedic ideas Wait, give me a good example really cool. uh, Okay, um, so A lot of times people will speak about Oshun Right, and again, I, I gave the example Not the example, but I broke down the name Earlier, how Oshun relates herself to the moon and what we're really dealing there with there is the menses and blood and, and, and the traveling of things at night. Even that draconis strain is related to Oshun. Dracula is related to Oshun. The dragon is related to Oshun. But as soon as you say the word Oshun, people get these warm feelings and they say, OK, I, I want to I want to find a mate. Um, what ritual can I do to Oshun to find love? OK, because they're looking for amorous love. And they don't really understand that Oshun is more dealing with the source of where you come from. The word Oshun also means the source. Okay, so you would invoke Oshun. Certainly you can invoke Oshun to draw forces together because Oshun governs the realm of dark matter. But you really want to deal with Oshun to dig into the traditions of your ancestors. Because Oshun takes you back to the source. The rivers always run back to their source. That's really what you're dealing with. 
you know, but, but, you know, so, um, because we see images of Oshun with the heart, when you look in the Vodun tradition, uh, more particular, you know, the, um, Haitian Vodun, you see the images of, of Erzuli Freda and she has the heart and we begin to believe that this is talking about amorous romance. And it, and it really has nothing to do with that. It's talking about the seat of your consciousness and the source of your consciousness when we're dealing with, with the heart. All right. I know even in Hebrew, of course, the heart would be the equivalent to what we call the holy place. Um, you know, we were looking at the structure of the Mosaic Temple. You have the outer gate, the um, holy place, and of course the holy of holy, which symbolizes um, Ori. Um, as you said earlier, uh, you know, or you know, our soul or higher self or, you know, right. um, so definitely, you know, um, that, that's why we do what we do as far as the medical, because we understand that there's a common thread that runs through all of the belief system, because um, all of the belief system had to have derived from one. And so by um, understanding that, you know, we get a more complete um, understanding you know, and understanding of, you know, of what we really, you know, need to be focusing on. And that, of course, is um, the physical body and the components of the physical body, you know, as it, you know, as it relates to as above, so below, as within, so without. So um, that, that, and that's why I love, you know, what you teach, brother, because um, that, that is, you know, where we need to be, you know, having the greatest understanding of, of the information, especially coming from our African um, religion. You know, Europe, uh, Yifa, Khan, um, you know, Intercomatic, or whatever the case is, you know. Um, you know, so we just need to be doing that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely, brother. You know, it's it's that, again, like you said, we can't really exclude anything. You said something so key is that it gives us the full picture because so many of the traditions have been invaded that when you just, when you read about a particular archetype or you read about a particular concept, and you don't allow yourself to see the broader brushstrokes, the broader picture, the global picture, or the cosmic picture, then you really are now just having to kind of take things on face value without gaining an understanding or a definition for yourself. And now you've just religiousized yourself all over again because you didn't, you didn't get that understanding. So even if I say, hey, Oshun deals with this, and you don't take the time to find out, well, who's, who's Venus? Who's Aphrodite? Um learning about the Kabbalistic system or what, what Sephiroth does Oshun reside on, you know, and, and learn the full picture of what's happened. Who's Mary Magdalene, you know, just go through it, you know, um, then it's, it's very, then, then you, it's very difficult to gain your own understanding, you know, it like very interesting what you said. And even at the correlations, uh, when you were speaking about the Ori and the holiest of the holies, right. Um, in this tradition, we have, um, a term Ara. A R A, and Ara in this tradition means body, or just in the language, it means body. So one of the things we'll say sometimes is the Ori Ara, but more importantly, because uh, again, <laughs> you know, like we said earlier, the Yoruba came out of Kemet. Okay, they migrated, uh, you know, out of Kemet. So I know as soon as I said Ara, you hear something in there. You hear that that word Ra, right? So Ara it means body. But more importantly, it means the seat of Ra. So the, it's even in this tradition, the body is considered to be the seat of Ra. And you even have a term, Ra Ra. Ra Ra is used, and Ra Ra means lightning. Okay? So it's an interesting word that we have here. Knowing that Ra is the seat of, or the Ara, the body is the seat of Ra. Ra Ra means lightning. We have a Yoruba word, uh, which is Irawo. Irawo and Irawo means star, okay. And uh, uh, Ra, you know, Ira, you know, that's that's um, Wo. Well, we'll go to Wo for a second. Wo means uh, something that has set or something that has gone down, something that has set or something that's gone down. And Ra or Ra Ra means lightning or the lightning aspect of God, you know, one of the old names for Shango. His original name was Jakuta Re or Jakuta Ra. Jakuta meant the stone thrower. And what that meant was stones, we were talking about meteorites. Okay, now this associates ourselves to, to the cobblestone. But we're talking about meteorites 
And those meteorites would come down. And that was also considered lightning because Jakuta Ra or Jakuta Re means Ra. It's the same Ra from Kemet. You know, so we, we have that concept again. So when you have the idea of the star, Iwa Wo, Iwa Wo literally means Ra has come to this place or Ra has been here. So that being that reflection. Mm-hmm. Like even in the ancient mm-hmm. Semitic, it, you know, that Ur Ra, you know, you are R A Ur Ra is the great light. And of course, you right. know, that developed into um, into Arabic later on is, you know, Allah. You know, and Muslims mm-hmm. even today still say Allah. You know, you right. L-L-L-L-L-L. Right. You know, so, right. you know, you know, that goes back to what you're saying. Is that. Please join us as the Sadulu House Spiritual Center exhibits at the Mind, Body, and Spirit Expo, which is the largest holistic and spiritual expo in the tri-state area, on May 2nd through May 4th at the Garden State Exhibit Center in Somerset, New Jersey, located at 50 Somerset Drive in Somerset, New Jersey. At this three-day event, you will have access to national and international exhibitors and speakers, including our very own master teacher, author, spiritual guide, and chief jagna of the Sadhu House Spiritual Center, H. Yuya Asan Anu. H. Yuya Asan Anu will take participants of the lecture through various steps, which will attune each individual in attendance to their own unique genius, source frequency, and improve the quality of their life. The lecture will take place Saturday, May 3rd at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the Room General 2 at the Garden State Exhibit Center, and it is free to attend this lecture. Please visit www.mindbodyspiritexpo.com and click the link for speakers and lectures for more information. We also urge you to check out the exhibition at the Mind, Body, and Soul Expo as the Sadulu House Spiritual Center will be exhibiting its products and services all three days. The Sadulu House Spiritual Center exhibition booth will include discounted classes, spiritual consultations, spiritual tools and divination supplies, books, DVDs, and more. Our booth location number is A10A. If you decide to come to the expo, you will also have access to free lectures, three days of free yoga classes, workshops, natural products, holistic health products, live entertainment, including music, drumming, chanting, and more. The Mind, Body, and Spirit Expo is May 2nd from 4 to 9 p.m., May 3rd from 10 to 8 p.m., May 4th from 10 to 6 p.m., and is located at the Garden State Exhibition Center at 50 Atrium Drive, Somerset, New Jersey, 08873. The cost is $5 to enter on Friday and $15 to enter on Saturday and Sunday. There are discounts available. So, for more details and to RSVP for the exhibition and lecture, please visit www.meetup.com forward slash African hyphen spirit hyphen workers. See you there. It's all connected. And the key is with all of this, what we're speaking about is a traveling back to the one. And that that was really or is really um I guess that the the ultimate point <laughs> that um, you know I, I'm I wanted to deliver in this evening that when you're dealing with the Okan or the idea of the heart or even as we're sitting here loving and and just you know enjoying this new energy of the blood moon and, and so forth and so on understanding what it really means is a traveling back to the source and that is one of the like it or not you know uh, the advantages of living here in the West where where uh Osaw resurrects himself but you know living here in the in the west uh it allows us now to break down some of the walls of nations that we had before these dividing walls uh that began to build up over time where we weren't sharing 
and dabbling in these traditions. Just in the just in the short time that you and I have spoken here, we've spoken about the Hebrew uh, paradigm. We've spoken about Yoruba. We've spoken about Akan, you know, uh, Grecian, you know. So uh, we've been able and Kemetic, of course. We've been able to do so much geographical travel because we're 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 we're, we're both leaning. All three of us are leaning on that one, that Okan, that Khan. You know, um, that one rhythm, that one beat, that downbeat, or that ohm. Going back to, again, the, the concept of the ohm, you know, the, the awakening of the earth or the highest part of self, which is the mo or the ohm. You know, so, you know, it's it's a critical thing to kind of understand because, uh, like I said, just with Yoruba tradition and even, you know, the, the traditions and the people who you may, who you may encounter, um, when you start speaking about Ifa and Arisha and Babala and whatnot, a lot of times people get a little dismissive. And I understand <laughs> because there are a lot of people in the tradition who are just about a lot of spookism, you know, and, oh, man, if you feed them this, they're going to do this. You feed them that, they're going to do that. And I have to tell you, the tradition, I just I just came back from the continent, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. And the elders over there they're not even on it like that the elders over there are still studying the Kabbalah you see now that, that would be a, a big shock <laughs> for for all the the Orisha and Ifa people over here in the states who, who thinking they still doing you know the stuff that you're getting here that's not really the fire you know you gotta go there and you gotta get in with the elders and you'll see that they're not even studying what you think they're studying you know they, they understand the unity of it, and this is how they're making things happen. How they're trying to get their oil back and, and do some real work, you know. Um, and again, it brings us to that concept and the notion of the, of the oneness of the Okan, you know, of going back to the source and calling the heart, which was really, um, as you probably know, which is one of the the main functions of the salute, or what we also call the salat. You know, uh, we know that dua is prayer, but that salat it was really a salute. To the heart Okay Calling the heart forth Singing inside of the heart Singing to the heart You know Even that number five Is significant Because that's Oshun's number You know uh, So singing And enlivening That heart chakra Is critical Because at that point You know At that gateway You decide Which way you want to go With this thing If I want to fall Into Aie Into the colors Of the lower chakras Or if I want to go up You know Into the Um Oblivion and the infant, the, the infiniteness, infiniteness of the higher chakras. You know, so um, yeah, that one, that one is critical. Oh no, 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 no! That's, that's excellent, brother. I mean, um, you know, I, I love the way in which that um, you, you know, you putting it together. I mean, that's the way that all of this needs to be doing so that we can get a better, complete picture. You know, I, it's, it's, to me, this whole thing is like a. Um, you know, like, you know, just pieces of a puzzle, you know, and, you know, just places in which that, um, I, I mean, even when I got into Islam, I mean, um, you know, over, you know, 25 years ago, I mean, we was taught off the bat, you seek knowledge to the cradle to the grave, you seek knowledge even if it's in China, so, mm. um, and that, you know, so even while I was, you know, much more Islamic, I can tell you, you know, I, I was I was going to the Buddhist temple. You know, I was going, you know, to the um, Hindu um, temple. You know, I was still studying um, everything, you know. And so, um, the Moorish thing was just, you know, just was just another step. When I seen, you know, on the court, of course, the stage, you know, that we honor all prophets, you know, whether how allegorical they are, like Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius. So then, you know, that right there, just say, okay, this is where you have to learn how to become universal in your thinking, you know, and um, you just can't be, you know, put in a box in just one particular belief system or faith, because right. the belief system is always growing, is always evolving, you know, you always right. are learning and being educated, you know, so I mean, that is a life you know, that is a life thing. You know, that's not something I wish that you think that you have because your mother and father taught you something. You know, or to, you know, uh, you know um, so, I mean, that's the way I'm looking at it. What about you, brother, um, Fahim? What, um, what's your, um, what's your, um, 
Yes, uh, you see about uh, the says on the uh, nationality card of the Board of Science Temples that says that these uh, that we pay homage to all of the uh, prophets, you know, uh, uh, Muhammad, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Buddha, and so on. Uh, because all uh, our science is a lot it's in all of them. You know, like the brother said earlier, uh, they all one and the same. You know, there's genetic science, and uh, all we say is it's all more science. You know, it's a, a kinetic more science, or yoga book, or you know, it's all the same science. And that's how I look at it. Yeah. These, these are uh, all of our science lie at. You know, and I, I never, I never really separate them. I always consider them as all as one. And you know what's, what's, what's interesting, because again, going back to the Yoruba, we have a term by the name of Ojiji, and Ojiji is what many people would relate to as Chi. Ojiji is Chi, it's the same thing. And it's that electromagnetic energy, but it's considered to be subatomic energy, you know, and it again brings us now and interesting enough in the in the Okan tradition you, you oh no, I'm sorry not Okan in Igbo in Igbo they have a, a chi and chi is the name of, of their deity you know but you have in this this particular region you know in Nigeria this search and understanding of subatomic beginnings or subatomic energy is critical so wherever there's a study of subatomic energy they're going to be there whether it's, it's Tai Chi or whether it's Qi Gong, you're going to find someone who's really understanding the European perspective. They're going to be there to study. They're going to be there to learn that because subatomic energy, again, Atum Mare, Oludu Mare, dealing with the, the atomic beginnings, that's the supreme deity. The understanding of how, you know, um, atoms form and using your mind to form them, using your. Um, your chi or using your ashe to create and formulate the light in the forms that you want it however we get to learn that we're going to do it you know i'm speaking as someone in the, in that tradition in ifa in orisha however i can get there whether it's, it's crystals hugging trees you know buddhism you know islam however i'm gonna get there i mean i'm that's that's what the aim is if, if there's any religion that we're shackled to it's the study it's the study of subatomic energy they all different exactly. stages of learning, you know, one stage of learning, another stage of learning, another stage of learning, but they all all coincide with each other, you know. Mm. It's a different level of learning, you know, that's how I see it and how I look at it. And, uh, you know, uh, that's how I understand it, you know, from my perspective, you know. I, yeah, there, there are levels and the um, the understanding even here is that one important thing I, I, I should uh, not definitely leave out is that when you're dealing with the, the realm of the Okan, even though you're dealing with the realm of consciousness and light and the body is made of consciousness and light, no one can actually survive in the realm of, of the Okan for an extended period of time. Okay, so people who have tried to do that, you know, we have stories about that in Yoruba land. They've gone um, beyond what one would call crazy. Okay, so it's it's not a place that you can be because again, our mind here, unless unless your first eye, unless you, you unless you've experienced the rapture, and the Son of Man or Solomon has come between, you know, who's rose above the clouds, has come to the clouds. So I'm talking about your pineal coming fully online and going beyond the clouds of your left and right brain hemispheres then you're still stuck in, in the world of duality and the Okan doesn't work on duality and not having that sense of duality will actually drive a person insane so the Okan is something that you would strive towards like you know one of the things we spoke about last time brother Aileen was the work that you do with being able to help people open up their chakras and bring their, their, their kundalini Bring that, that serpent of Dambala Or Oshumare Bring that up the spine But it, it's, it's not a state that a person is going to stay For 20 years You know with just everything wide open <laughs> You know like that um, Just in, in the brief little moments That people do open up 
is when people across on the other side of the world, they see apparitions. They see what they call uh, flying saucers or flying wheels in the sky, you know. Um, so it's not a, a state that one could necessarily maintain for an extended period in their physical body. But it's where you go. It's like it's like school. It's where you go to learn something to get your knowing and then come back. Almost like a dream state. Exactly. So I want to kind of touch on that. Right. Right. Imagine the constant flow of DMT. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right, right. That's, just imagine the concept of DMT. You know, DMT is said to be going to be produced during the time of birth and during the time of death, unless you're doing some real serious major breathing exercises and meditation techniques um, in between um, birth and death. Um, will DMT come online, which is actually a spirit on the pineal gland as one of those spiritual substances called the spirit molecule? Um, going back to those atomic particles and slash subatomic particles as you as you're mentioning, you know, and so yeah, it, it, um, it's very hard to imagine that, you know, you doing that, you know, what I'm saying, or that being excreted your whole entire life, you know. So, um, you know, that is a psychedelic, you know, experience. So, like what you're talking about, um, you know, as a person. Um, the to that extent, and like you said, they're going beyond the left and right hemisphere, or you know, they're going beyond the duality. But they can't maintain that state because of their, um, you know, they still have a physical body to maintain. You know, right, right. So, so I mean, they have to be going to start looking at it also. But these are just glimpses right. into. Um, the heavenly state in which that you can obtain and will obtain, um, you know, especially after leaving the physical body, because as you always say, um, you know, what dreams may come. You know, the whole point is that when you go to sleep at night, you know, um, if you spend a third of your life sleep, you know, if you live to be 75 and you spend 25 years sleep, and only 50 years walking and talking, breathing, and doing whatever you're on planet Earth. Only 25 the time, um, in you know in the spiritual realm you know the same realm of sleep you know uh, what is called you know I guess you say psychologically or in psychiatry you know, it's called you know the various states of consciousness you know go from gamma to beta to alpha to delta to theta and right and so um, yes you might enter theta or uh, delta theta you know those deepest levels you know, which is like near death experience or what's called out of the body experience, whatever it is. You know, but you know, that that is for, you know, those moments. You know what I'm saying? In order to give you a glimpse of what, you know, happens after the um, the cutting of that civil cord or that ethereal cord. Mm-hmm. And that's you know, it's interesting because I brought this up on a show I did recently and I was speaking about um there was a there was a moment in the movie The Matrix where Morpheus, uh, the one, was speaking to Neo, the uh, Inspirer, and Morpheus, um, you know, this is when he was first taking him when he was first expelled from the Matrix, Neo, and Morpheus was kind of getting him caught up to speed, and he brings him into a space and he speaks about you know um, what's real, you know, he's saying is it just what you touch, see, hear, and feel. You know, he's dealing with the five senses reality and saying if so, then that's just electrical signals being sent to your brain. But it's a key line he said at one point when when the image is changed and he said, welcome to the desert of the real. And, you know, what was critical about that when he said, welcome to the desert of the real, you know, he was speaking about, he showed him, well, this is what the earth actually looks like now. You know, he saw it, so showed it in complete desolation. But the reality is, is that even though he said, welcome to the desert of the real. And, you know, when we're thinking about a desert reality, we're thinking about uh, complete and utter contact with with the environment, the forces and the elements, because there's no there's nothing keeping you away from your connection with the ground or with the most high. There's no obstructions. So that's one of the sciences of the desert. It allows you to really contact your physical environment and reality. And more importantly, um, not be as aware of it, even though you're contacting it because it's, it's, you're in desolation, basically. So when he said, welcome to the desert of the real, almost as if he was touching the real, but in fact, he was still inside of a simulator. And 
it was noted that at that time the earth was in such condition that humans couldn't you couldn't breathe anyway it so you know because of the entire ozone so what kind of was 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 stated even in kind of what you were just saying here and correlating with that is that we couldn't touch what's real even if we wanted to because our physical bodies couldn't couldn't withstand the fullness of what is real we can only get reflections of what is real that's why people say i'm reflecting my higher self but you could you couldn't even actually come in contact with your higher self fully because you'd be destroyed in the same instance neo couldn't actually go into the real world he, he, his body you know when we think about the concept of ether you know, and we look at the Grecian con concept, it was always taught that ether was the breath of the gods. It was so humans couldn't live there. Only gods could. So if you're functioning and manifesting on that level, then you can breathe ether. So he couldn't even breathe the realness of the world, but he could look at it inside of a computer simulator. And that was rough enough for him. You know, so again, relating it back <laughs> to that concept of, of um, can we really accept what's real? And on the same the same token, when we brag about being unplugged from the matrix, are we truly really unplugged from the matrix or are we just in a place now where we're able to see simulations that other people have not seen yet? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So dealing with uh, you were saying about the uh, breathing techniques and meditation, how we spend uh, so many uh, and life and death, you know, so many times going to sleep. And uh, the thing about me, uh, 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 learning this uh, tonight, I, don't, I never thought about sleep as much. But yeah, you can say sleep does have a big thing to do, uh, very, I uh, think, a very big role in uh, doing our life here on, uh, on the planet. You know, uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's med it certain, has something to do with certain meditation. Uh, exercises and things like that and uh, you can have so many times you need to meditate and breathe and breathe and exercise along with it in order to uh, uh, clear out a lot of the antioxidants out of your body you know uh, I know you said on one uh, day one lecture that you didn't care how much you how, how much bowel movements you have or how much you urinate or how much you fast if you don't uh, put a lot of breathing exercises and meditation in there that's not going to do you any good you know what was key too about that that whole dream state that you brought up is that um, the the biological purpose for dreams now we know this there's an esoteric spiritual purpose and the spiritual purpose is take us to the astral realms, realms where we can go to learn because just like this world is temporary. The astral realms are temporary, but we need them in order to, to get information, basically. But biologically speaking, the, the purpose of dreaming, because you'll find that the majority of the time that you dream, um, the way it's designed, your, your actual sleep cycles, like Brother Aline was speaking about earlier, you know, going from those different shifting of the brain waves um, to different frequencies and pulsations. Uh, when you're actually going into your, your dream mode, it's usually only the last six to seven minutes of your actual sleeping time. And the purpose of dreaming is actually to wake the body up. You know, and I've always found that to be very interesting that the, the, the body creates dreams yeah, to wake you up. So then I always thought, well, if this if this reality is a dream, what am I being awoken to? You know, so um and, and that's the watery region uh, when we're dealing with the concept of dreams and, and awakening up to your real self. On In, in Ifa, when we're dealing with the um, like our divining surface, our casting surface, on the left side of that casting, casting surface, we call it Oso. And Oso is spelled O-S-O. -O. Uh, some might be familiar with Oso from the Orisha Ochosi, Oshosi, who spelled O-S-O-O-S-I. And, you know, when you break down the name Ochosi, it means the hidden sorcerer or the hidden magician. OK, Ososi is also an earlier form of Kansu. So, again, it takes us back to that nighttime blood travel. And we know that Kansu is an earlier form of Haru, you know, so it's just it, light and dark. 
you know, two two aspects of the same energy. But that watery left side dream energy where Olokun lives, where Oya lives, where Oshun lives, where the ancestors live, is where we're said to really deal with our dream world, our dream life. And what's critical there, because the ancestors live there, that's a realm that we consider to be the realm of death. Okay, and death understanding in this this tradition death is synonymous with uh luminosity okay uh death uh the word for death is iku i k u but the the operative root there is ku k u and ku k u is the same ku in comedic structure which is k h u well as as we see it spelled k h u which means light or luminosity so we understand that one has to go to the dark waters of death and Olokun and have to go to the, 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 the ancestor's dream in order to be illuminated, to come into a luminosity. That's the science of death in this, this particular tradition. You know, so it's, so you're it's, saying dreams is necessary. Dreams are necessary to wake us up. we got to have dreams. Okay. we got to have them. If, we, if you don't have a dream, you won't wake up. The body, right. the body needs a dream in order to awaken you. Yeah. And just like those sleep cycles are necessary, you know, as Brother Alim spoke about going from alpha to beta and going back and forth, back and forth. And it, it's, it happens. It's time. It, and the body times it so perfectly. It's very interesting. It's, it's, this is not a sloppy thing that happens when you go to sleep in terms of you going through each mode of your sleep cycle. It's pretty exact. You know, and even the moment when you begin to, to have what we call dreams or your night visions, that's also pretty exact too. you know, uh, timed again with the moment of your awakening. You know, so again, it kind of makes us look at the valleys and peaks that we go through in our own life, even the moments where we were maybe what we call unconscious or we were dealing with low vibrational energy and how sometimes we come into a high vibration and sometimes we, we, we fall off. You know, we, we go back to low vibration. It's almost like that same sleep cycle and that push and pull, that ebb and flow, that that polarizing of those dualities going back and forth is necessary for us to come to a place of understanding, which event will eventually awaken us out of this dream of the holographic reality. So, yeah, dreams are very necessary. <laughs> answer that question. Yeah, so, so sometimes uh, when I sleep... I could be half asleep still dreaming, you know, about something, you know, with that, uh, that I'm not, not actually asleep. And I notice uh, when I dream a lot, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I don't know, somewhat uh, still sleeping when I actually wake up in the morning. You know? mm -hmm. Right. Because imagine if you spent all night at a drafting table trying to design yourself a new wing on your home. So that's what you did all night in your sleep, which is a problem. You know, when when you when you rest at night, you're supposed to strictly go to the astral realms. You're using a different uh, body, your astral body, and you're doing a different kind of work. But the problem is a lot of times we go to bed with so many unresolved issues. And if you're if you're a thinker, you know, which obviously you are, you wouldn't be on this show. If you're a thinker, then you're going to still try to work out those equations when you go to sleep. So it, it, it doesn't stop. If you were sitting there sketching something out on paper, you're still sketching it out, but you're just now doing it in your sleep. So you basically stayed up all night working. You know, and that's why when you get up, you still have that, that sleepiness. It's also critical to note for the, for the family who's listening. You know, when you have those, those night visions too, where, you know, uh, you're flying or you're in a different place, or more importantly, you um, invite yourself to somebody else's dream, it's very important that when you get up that you do some form of spiritual cleanse, whether it be a prayer, if that's if that's your thing, whether it be a, a spiritual bath or maybe just ringing a bell around your body. Because, you know, you, you have to consider that uh, if, if you go into a place that's maybe unclean, it could be a courthouse or a police station, places like that, and you come back home, the first thing you're going to want to do is clean that energy off your body because you don't want it in your home. You don't want it on your furniture. Well, the same thing occurs when you have a night visions and you're traveling through the astral realm. Not all astral realms are realms of purity. You know, so when you're traveling and you come back into your body, you have to clean. 
you know. So just as a side note to, you know, the family listening, it's, it's critical to do that. It has something to do with cleaning, out a, cleaning off a lot of negative energy that you uh, probably absorbed during the day. Like you said, the police yeah. station or the courtroom. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes it's just the energy that doesn't belong with you. You know, what, whether it's, it's negative or po- positive, at the end of the day, uh, the spirits, they reside in a certain place for a reason. And the only, the only reason why they should be given and granted access over into your personal waking reality is if you intentionally invite them there and give them something to materialize in that reality. Uh, even if you don't invite them, many will try because uh, just like, you know, us, we, we're trying to evolve. We're trying to transform and get to the next place. Well, our mind, the womb of our mind and the matrix and the structure of our mind permeates throughout the entire universe. So because we want to evolve, not everything else wants to evolve because it's just following suit. So these same spirits, these hags, these duppies, these disincarnate bodies, they're trying to evolve into something else, too. You know, you you see that in all of the vampire movies, all of the vampires, they fall in love with humanity. You know, they got to constantly eat the blood because they want to still be able to touch things and everything. They want to evolve beyond being vampires. So even Arisha want to evolve beyond being Arisha. Spirits want to evolve around being spirits because they understand that the realm that they're in is temporary. Once we all get to where we're supposed to get, there's, there's no need for that realm anymore. Or those those realms, I should say, because there's many of them. There's no need for those realms and they fade away. So if you know you're a part of that, then the best thing you want to do is latch on to somebody who has a more eternal presence. I mean, it's no different than what we see in society. We have certain groups of people who clearly are not going to make it beyond certain stages of evolution on the planet. So the best thing they can do is attach themselves to the people who seem to have the most longevity, whether it be through miscegenation or rape or just um, the infusing of, of their DNA through various means with these individuals. Spirits think the same way. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, one of the things, too, is, is important with this idea of Okoran or that Odu is that it's actually symbolized by the head of twins. You know, it, it represents the human twins. And, you know, that's kind of going back to what we're saying. It's the um, it's that maotic link, the maotic link between your twin, between you and really your dark side, your dark side and your light side. Because when it, whenever, again, in this tradition, when we talk about matters of the heart, it's not like people think. It's not like, again, this amorous thing. In this tradition, when you start talking about mat- matters of the heart, you're really talking about going into a very fierce and aggressive side of yourself. Okay, that's that's what the, the heart represents because it, it represents now I'm getting ready to go into the, into the forest, that, which was a term I was using earlier. And um, the forest is, your, is your, your darkness or even possibly your... Um, your your misfortune in life you know uh the forest is also considered the underworld or heaven so as we see it in this tradition heaven is is basically carbon it's pure car is melanin you know um but you have to go in there you have to go through your misfortune you have to go through your aggression that's why there's even a term that's used uh in yoruba culture when you're dealing with like uh anything where a person has to assert himself and it's uh Koneo Khan Koneo Khan And Koneo Khan means This person has no heart So If you're not able to pull From your dark side You're considered to be Sick There's something wrong with you You know Even like in a football game You hear people chanting that Koneo Khan Because you're not really Trying to run through your opponent Like you're supposed to You should be pulling From your dark side And and, and annihilating the other team There's something wrong here You know You have no heart so it's just very interesting when you when you think and you look at the different un- cultural understandings of these terms that we use and sometimes how we try to apply our understanding and we miss all of it. We miss the, the, the whole thing. Yeah, so people are not uh, able to uh, rise up from their dark side. Uh, that reminds me of something of uh, esoteric. Uh, uh, the Bible, uh, when it says that... Uh, when uh, Pharaoh's uh, army, after Moses, is all symbolic, we all know, 
but uh, right. uh, 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 ready to see actually drown them. They will drown because water represents the oceans, and mm -hmm. the, the, the Egyptian army drowned because they could not rise above the emotions, so they drowned the emotions. Mm. That, 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 that you just said that that kind of right. uh, just coincides with that. Right, right. Yeah, you know, interesting enough, I mean, in Yoruba culture, um, and I mean, you don't even have to really know the spiritual aspect too much. You just look at Nigerians um, and understand first that Nigerians are Jamaicans. So if, if anybody, if you, even if you haven't been in Nigeria, if you've been in Jamaica or you know some Jamaicans, you're looking at a Nigerian. Um, the, it, it, you know, if you if you fall asleep <laughs> in in country in Jamaica, you know you go to certain places, Maypen, you know Corindon. You go you go out to the country, you wake up, you don't you won't know if you're in Nigeria, if you're in Jamaica. The people look the same, the homes look the same, they act the same. All that same fire is there, you know. So Nigerian culture within itself is is definitely not a culture of uh, reservation. It's a culture of high emotion, you know, which is key and. And, and a lot of the um, stories you have even um, like Olokun, Olokun, the owner of the oceans, the seas. This is a very emotional and violent archetype when you're dealing with Olokun. Olokun is so violent that it was said that Obatala had to chain him to the bottom of, of the ocean floor because he, he flooded the world at one point. He almost got away with it. But what Obatala did was he dropped the chain down so some people could climb up and be saved. Now, what that represented, whenever you're dealing with Olokun, not only are you dealing with the subconscious mind, but you're dealing with the sleeping subconscious mind. So that represented the time when the world became dumb, basically. <laughs> you know, when we really fell from, from, our, from our glory. And it, Obatala represents, the, obviously, that creative spark, the higher spark. Dropping down that chain represents that evolution, that DNA chain. He dropped down. And certain people were able to evolve, just like what you're talking about. Certain people were able to evolve by grabbing onto that chain and climbing up and saving themselves from the flood of, of Olokun, which was really the flood of the sleeping subconscious mind. You know, so uh, it takes us back even to our understanding of, of Atlantis, you know, and you know, Atlantis being, you know, when it sunk into the sea, that was the, the sleeping of the people, that pineal going down into the water, you know, and, and sleeping for a time, you know, for a time. But, it, it, you know, there's a time when that chain will be broken. You know, some people will be saved. And it's really now about natural selection. It's about those who are who are mental and spiritual alphas joining and mating with one another. And the betas are being drowned in the sea of their own emotions and um, sleeping subconscious. One of the things that I, I wanted to mention and I've been really encountering in different seminars and workshops that I've been doing lately is uh, attachments that people really have to the moral structure of what they consider to be Orisha and Ifa tradition. And um, sometimes when I start speaking about uh, how it's not so much about what you perceive to be a human morality, because these spirits don't even deal in that. Um, you know, I can see the hurt or the offense in people's faces. And, you know, I would say to you that now is the time, us being here in the West, this is a time for sobriety. And this is a time for us to study these traditions with a with a much, uh, well, I'm going to go back to what the elder said, which are which much, much uh, more reduced emotional perspective and standpoint it is your emotions that's going to keep you ignorant in this now we use emotions for the purposes of driving and pushing spirit in various directions emotions are energy and motion we use it but when you're studying you have to use your logical mind illuminated by your spirit body okay so um just because because a lot of times when i'm speaking people will say well, wow this is not what i was taught before though you know and you know, you you got to be responsible for redefining and shining light on your own indoctrination. No one can do that for you, you know. But I really, um, I hope, you know, I don't use that much that word much, but I really hope that my people here in this land uh, begin to study these traditions and stop looking to find new religions and new gods to serve and worship, but um, take them all in because over here, like I said. Um, 
I have a lot of friends on the continent, you know, very connected with the continent and uh, the people there. And I'm going to tell you straight up, you know, the conscious people live here. Okay, so if you if you're trying to study these traditions because you want to regain some glory and you're going to you think you're going to go back to Nigeria and you're going to be celebrated, it's not going to happen like that. You know, the people who are really brothers, brothers like Brother Ali, you know, shows like this, people who are really breaking down this information, uh, it's not happening over there. So you, you got to get it here. You got to make it happen here and then bring that back home and the family will love you even more for it. Trust me, they're not offended. When, when I go and speak these same concepts, they love it, you know. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there for all of my um, Ifa and Arisha people uh, just to give you something We thank you for your listening support and urge you to become an active participating member of the A New Order. Please be sure to follow our Ustream broadcast, which can be found at ustream.tv forward slash channel forward slash enlightenment hyphen and hyphen transformation. That is U-S-T-R-E-A-M dot TV forward slash channel forward slash E-N-L-I-G-H-T-E-N-M-E-N-T hyphen A-N-D hyphen T-R-A-N-S-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N Also, please be sure to sign up for the A New Newsletter, which can be found by going to anewnation.org. That is A-N-U-N-A-T-I-O-N dot org. If you'd like to become a sponsor or an on-air guest, on this or any of our other broadcast, please be sure to contact us at questions at a new nation dot org. That is the word questions at a new nation dot org. Thank you for your continued support and be well.